The Assassin's Creed franchise has had a rough few years. After the immensely successful Black Flag, Ubisoft released two immensely unsuccessful sequels. Assassin's Creed Unity was a train wreck mired by technical issues, sluggish controls, and unfocused storytelling. Assassin's Creed Syndicate was more of the same but with a grappling hook. Bad press resulted with bad sales, which prompted the French publisher to take one year off between releases to ensure polish. As the franchise had become annualized, since 2009 if you can believe it, this was big news. Eventually, details about the next entry began to seep through the cracks, with tidbits of a new setting teasing at a possible overhaul of the AC experience. Under the codename Empire, it seemed the next game would be taking place in ancient Egypt, meaning the series would be shifting focus from sprawling metropolises to large tracts of nature. This wouldn't be the first time. Assassin's Creed 3, Black Flag, and Rogue did just this, but with the general fatigue most were feeling towards the AC formula, many hoped Ubisoft would attempt to reinvent the series, a la Resident Evil 4 and 7 style. When it was revealed that Ashraf Ismail, the man responsible for the much-beloved Black Flag, would be helming its development, that hope grew into optimism. But rather than delving into experimentation, Ubisoft has essentially made The Witcher light. They adopted many of CDPR's design philosophies, but filter them through a lens which makes Origins feel more familiar than many were hoping for. And you know what? That's fine. Because while it isn't breaking any new ground, Origins is definitely the best this franchise has ever been. By a long shot. Origins centers around Bayek, a Mejai from a region in Egypt called Siwa. What's a Mejai, you ask? Historically, they were a priesthood acting as administrators of the pharaoh's lands and properties. The game depicts them more as a police force, which is grounded in some historical truth, though after the 20th dynasty, they disappeared from the Egyptian record entirely, which means Bayek being one of them is a stretch to say the least. It's no biggie though. Nobody plays these games for historical accuracy. Assassin's Creed is all about, duh, assassinations, and you'll be doing plenty of these over the course of Origins. You see, Bayek is out for blood, after his son is murdered by the agents of a tyrant, he embarks on a campaign across the various regions of Egypt to kill those responsible. Unfortunately for him, he doesn't know who they are. Their identities were hidden away behind masks and aliases. And to make matters worse, they are of course wrapped up in a conspiracy involving a who's who of names from ancient Greece, Rome, and Egypt. Like with every AC before it, Origins has players rubbing elbows with major historical figures. Bayek will bask upon the beauty of Cleopatra, fight alongside Julius Caesar, and contend with the forces of Ptolemy XIII. And he won't have to do it alone. His wife Aya plays a role in the narrative as well, and together they make up the emotional core of the game. Like with every AC before it, the historical stuff takes place inside of the Animus, a VR device that allows users from the modern day to relive events of the past by accessing memories stored in their genetics. It's all pseudoscience, really but the core conceit is interesting and makes for some playful bits of meta self-referencing. Some are cool, such as the reveal that Watch Dogs is canon. Some are not, such as the reveal that the AC movie is too. The modern day stuff has always been divisive. There are those who love it and those who can't stand it. Origins won't change naysayers' opinions on the matter. While it initially hints at moving the overarching plot forward, it ends up being inconsequential, which is fine by me. I checked out years ago. Juno and the threat she poses has never been more compelling than what's going on inside the Animus. Origin keeps with this tradition and a few others as well, for better or for worse. The writing, for instance, doesn't transcend the boxed wine quality of previous games. Much of it just feels expository. However, at the same time, it isn't entirely devoid of personality. When characters aren't doomsaying or ruminating on their mission, they actually feel human. They'll laugh, cry, and talk just like real folk do. Just not for too long. AC still hasn't learned to take time away from its plot to let these characters breathe. Such as the hero of Origins, Bayek. While far from amazing, he's more complex than he initially appears. For one, there's a warmth and humor to him. It humanizes Bayek just enough to make him stand out. While out in the world side-questing or helping his allies, these moments are fleeting, which makes his characterization feel inconsistent at times. However, when alongside his wife Aya, the real Bayek appears, and his personality gets to shine. On a surface level, they come off as your typical power couple. They can be a bit handsy, but there's an obvious love between them, visible in the familiarity and implied history of their dialogue. But it's all a mask. Bayek and Aya are flawed. They're broken. It doesn't take a genius to know what caused it. The murder of their son, sweet, innocent Kimu. As Origins progresses, we get to see the cracks in their metal. 
and learn that those cracks are only spreading further, due in part to how they cope with their grief. Bayek in his bloody campaign for vengeance, Aya in the misplaced alliances she makes. Everything that they do or don't do is in service of that grief. Regardless of what good comes from Kemu's passing, their marriage is on life support. It's a convincing reaction to loss, and Bayek cuts a genuinely empathetic figure. The game does a respectable job expressing his grief even outside of cutscenes. One of Origin's many side quests involve finding stone circles scattered throughout the world. Here, players take part in simple stargazing puzzles. These aren't the most engaging from a gameplay perspective, but they allow Bayek an opportunity to reflect upon memories of his son. Best of all, they end with that wonderfully affecting animation, Bayek clasping a stone to his bosom as a bittersweet smile settles across his face. For all of his inconsistencies, Bayek remains remarkably likable. You'll have to work a little harder to get to know him, but he's certainly worth the effort. Aya, on the other hand, isn't the closed book that her husband is. As the game's secondary protagonist, she has very few scenes in comparison to Bayek, but Ubisoft utilizes her screen time well. Every line and every bit of animation helps characterize her. She's strong and assertive, with the qualities of a good leader. Aya isn't hypersexualized, nor are her moments of sexualization gratuitous. She is shown in equal footing with Bayek. He's not her knight in shining armor. Like him, she's a capable warrior and brilliant tactician. They're partners in every sense of the word. Nevertheless, Aya is still not perfect. She becomes enthralled into Cleopatra's cult of personality off-screen. There's absolutely no easing into this. It essentially plays out as one day she's working with Cleopatra, the next she's the treasurer of her fan club. It's disappointing because this easily could have been avoided. All Ubisoft had to do was take time away from the game's more bloated parts to develop Aya's motivations properly. Instead, they dedicated the bulk of the narrative to Bayek tracking down his assassination targets, and even this is poorly handled. You see, because the people who murdered his son were wearing masks, Bayek has to first identify who they are before he can take them out. While this makes sense and even adds an air of intrigue to the proceedings, it also means you'll be spending most of your time getting to know them indirectly through their crimes. On paper, this is a neat idea. Problem is, as soon as their identities come to light, you kill them. Targets are dispatched of immediately, meaning the player is given no opportunity to establish a relationship with them or to understand their motivations. All you get are brief moments of ideological justification which are meant to feel salient but ultimately fall flat because nothing is earned. Then it's on to the next target, lather, rinse, repeat. Sadly, Origins' villain problem isn't an isolated incident. It's been a source of contention since game one. There's just no moral grayness to the Templars, most are just one-dimensional cartoon characters. Yes, there are occasional outliers. For instance, there's Rogue. Its perspective reversal puts players in control of an assassin who defects to the Templars. Main character, Shay Cormac, is frequently conflicted, especially when pulling the trigger on his former allies. Rogue grants players a more nuanced look into the Templars' goal for societal utopia. And Ubisoft almost pulls it off. But instead of having both sides steeped in moral uncertainty, they just make the assassins the villains, having them act recklessly and uncompromising in their pursuit of some stupid MacGuffin. Ironically, the one entry in the series that seems to get it right is the one that's also the most maligned, Assassin's Creed 3. For all of that game's faults, it handles its villains far better than any other AC. For one, Ubisoft took their time establishing the Templars. We are first introduced to Haytham, the main baddie in the prologue. Players are given control over him as he amasses the cabal of Templars who will ultimately serve as your assassination targets later on. Over the course of the game, we get to see what makes them tick. This goes a long way in helping us understand their motivations, whether it be greed or some misguided perversion of the greater good. Probably the most successful part of Assassin's Creed 3's villain design is the dynamic between Haytham and the game's main protagonist, Connor. Because of their blood relations, they each want to settle their differences while also swaying the other to their respective side, Connor being an assassin, Haytham being a Templar. What ensues are heated philosophical debates barbed by undercurrents of familial estrangement. As one would expect, it only ends in bloodshed, but the relationship adds pathos to the age-old conflict between the assassins and Templars. Even when Haytham is out of the picture, Connor's beef with Charles Lee is well established, so when he finally drives that blade through his chest, it feels hard-earned and satisfying. There is nothing synonymous to this in Origins. Targets are eliminated as quickly as they're revealed. This could have been mitigated by cutting the number of assassination targets down by half. Do we really need 12? I'd argue not. 
That time would have been better served developing the game's more important villains or showing Aya's transition into Cleopatra's superfan number one. Secondary characters fare far worse. Outside of Bayek or Aya, emotional beats rarely feel earned. Let's consider Shadia. With but a bop of the nose, this little one will charm her way into yours and Bayek's heart. I grew hopeful that she'd be around for a while, and that we get to see a different side to our friendly neighborhood Magi. A fatherly side, warm and good-natured. But ten minutes later, I cast my hopes to the wind. I'll give credit where credit is due. The finality surrounding those ten minutes serve as a good parallel to the Kemu plot, as it recontextualizes Bayek and Aya's bloody vendetta. But, like with everything in Origins, the game rushes towards an emotional climax without taking the time to earn it. I don't know these characters, I can't conjure up feelings for strangers, let alone cartoon strangers, and inflicting tragedy on this family ten minutes after introducing them is nothing more than shorthand to easy feels. Characters should be more than proxies for a story's themes. They should feel believable. Sadly, the only thing this feels is contrived. Worse, knowing what happens to Shadia makes this introductory scene feel far more manipulative. Shame on you, Ubisoft. What makes it so disheartening is that the scenes in question are still good. They're well directed, well acted, and relatively speaking, well written. But this no foreplay approach to storytelling undercuts all the emotional impact. If The Witcher 3 shows us the power of emotional investment, then Origin shows us the high cost of shorthand. Sadly, messy characterization translates over to a messy narrative. It isn't bad by any means, it's just all over the place. Bayek's personal quest struggles to coexist alongside the historical fiction. Besides poorly handled villains, the game's final act is a linear jumble of explosive set pieces which happen so quickly that by the time it's done, you'll likely forget a lot of what transpired. It's an issue of pacing more than anything else, which, I know, is a problem with open world games in general. Even The Witcher 3 and Horizon, which both tell incredible stories, occasionally struggle to feel cohesive, but this is a different beast entirely. It isn't the result of side content truncating the narrative, but the narrative itself. I feel comfortable saying Bayek's and Aya's relationship is the one successful part of Origin's story. The death of their son is what drives them, and how they articulate their grief is what makes them so fascinating. Bayek finding purpose and vengeance, Aya in the nascent brotherhood she ends up founding. But everything else is either clumsily executed or just squandered. Much of the early game feels padded by assassination targets that get no development. Conversely, the final act sprints to a conclusion that feels rushed. Taking a step back and viewing it from beyond the veil, it's obvious Ubisoft misinterpreted what made The Witcher 3 so great. They got the content part of it right, but not the context. For all of its similarities to The Witcher 3, the linearity of its final act isn't terribly different from Final Fantasy XV's, another game which suffers from an on-rails denouement. Which I suppose is fitting, considering the weird collaboration between Square Enix and Ubisoft. Seeing Arden appear in the game world is both exciting and strange, especially when you consider how stringent the AC games are about continuity. Which is why it's best to view these missions as some video game ass video game content. NSA all the way, right? I mean, no one's gonna complain, it's free, and it's good content, as is a lot of the other content found in game. Exhibit B in the Origins as Witcher Light argument are the secondary quests. Ubisoft learned narrative lessons from CDPR, resulting with a greater focus on evolving quest design. Like in The Witcher 3, secondary missions are often sprawling, sometimes spanning more than one region and their surface-level narratives tend to become more complex as quests go on. Impressively, Ubisoft comes up with a good solution to the pacing issues called by side quests. Typically, open-world games have a difficult time maintaining cohesion in narrative. It's a byproduct of players constantly being distracted by shiny markers on a map. But in Origins, many of the secondary quests relate to the main plot. Bayek will encounter randos in the world, who, in typical open-world fashion, have problems only he can solve. These problems tie directly to the respective assassination target of a region. It's a clever workaround, which makes these quests feel like a part of something whole. Problem is, the writing isn't anywhere near as inventive as the solution. It's never bad, and it's grounded by some solid voice work, but it does maintain the series' status quo for boxwine dialogue. The other side quests are a mixed bag. The aforementioned stone circles aren't challenging, but they do break up the core gameplay loops and provide affecting moments for Bayek. The papyri puzzles offer fun scavenger hunts for powerful loot, while the ancient tombs promise mystery and reward in equal measure. Sadly, not all side quests are created equal. There are also elephant fights, which are just as miserable as they sound. 
Meanwhile, the award for the most pointless point of interest goes to meditation spots. These don't need to be a thing. The entire map is a meditation spot. Additionally, the quest design is inconsistent. While tailing missions are mostly a thing of the past, fetch quests are not. In fact, they're here in full force. Instead of fetching keys or important documents, Origins has you fetching actual people. Yes, you heard me right. Many missions involve infiltrating a fortress to rescue someone who can't walk. I'll keep it simple. These suck, they're not fun, and their challenge feels artificial. Thankfully, Origins aspires for more in the gameplay department. Combat has been overhauled mostly for the better. It borrows heavily from the Dark Souls series, even more so than The Witcher 3 does, and I don't mean this in the it's the Dark Souls of open world games kind of way. I'm talking design and structure. For one, AC has gone full-blown action RPG on us. There are numbers being crunched behind the scenes, which dictate how effective your attacks and weapons are, as both have their own stats that can be leveled. Even the Hidden Blade, which was an instant kill in previous games, has to be appropriately leveled before it can be lethal. The button mapping is identical to Souls, with the exception of the dodge and repost buttons. There's also circle strafing, charged heavy attacks, a lock-on, and an emphasis on positioning and hitboxes. Gone are the days of being magnetically drawn to an opponent. If you swing and no one's around, you're gonna miss and leave yourself open for damage. It's incredible how blatantly they cribbed Souls' combat, though at the same time, the Mordor games blatantly cribbed Arkham's combat and people seemed fine with that. I suppose imitation really is the greatest form of flattery. But that's unfortunately what it is, an imitation. Origins' combat lacks the fluidity and kinesthetics of Souls. Bayak is rubbery with a dodge that covers very little ground. It's not a death sentence when fighting low-level enemies, but in boss battles it can lead to some frustrating moments when their attacks aren't designed around Bayak's limited mobility, and especially when the game forces players to use suboptimal equipment. Oh yeah, it does that from time to time. Boss battles also tend to devolve into aggravating loops of Bayak falling to low health and you retreating to replenish it. Except there's no Estus equivalent or healing potions. You instead rejuvenate vitality with time, and you know that shit ain't quick. Making matters worse, the game doesn't allow you to run in combat, so retreating is always a slow trench backwards. This makes larger fights feel like a war of attrition, with the biggest resource drain being your patience, which I doubt was at Ubisoft's intention. That being said, this is definitely a step in the right direction. The Souls-based combat offers more challenging and satisfying play, and it's an unexpectedly good fit for the series too. If they could just find a way to merge it with the over-the-top theatrics of previous combat systems, Ubisoft might finally hit pay dirt. For the first time in the franchise, UI noise is actually kept at a minimum. There's no obstructive minimap, menus don't overlap, and the HUD operates on a need-to-know basis. It's not perfect, the game still shouts at you if you don't take your torch out the second you walk into a dark cavern, but it's an obvious improvement. Even the underwater sections, which I initially dreaded, are entirely frictionless. Bayek has got preternaturally good lung capacity, and he can fight while fully submerged. Plus, there's some kind of algorithm in place which ensures that you're never without a boat. Probably the biggest success of Origins, the one thing it does better than The Witcher 3, is its open world. It's a stunning recreation of ancient Egypt, not just as a handful of cities in a desert, but as a country. There is an incredible amount of diversity amongst its biomes, with the vibrant greenery of the north standing in contrast to the amber hues of the south. And there's an actual ecology to it all. There are different animals, plants, trees, and climates for almost all of the map's 30-plus regions. Cities and settlements have their own cultures, which provide an insight of sorts into the everyday life of the common man. For instance, Alexandria stands as a triumph of architecture and technology, while Crocodilopolis is a civilization built upon a religious reverence for... You guessed it, crocs. There's natural verticality to it, which isn't an obstacle since Bayek can scale just about anything. It all works to sell the physicality and vastness of the world. It doesn't hurt that the game is absolutely gorgeous. Lighting gives the greens a pastoral glow. In the desert, sand blows across dunes as palm trees sway in the wind. The water laps and ripples, the sun's reflection giving it all a surreal calm. Like with Horizon, it has a photo mode, which can be used to capture each and every one of these jaw-dropping vistas. Ultimately, as impressive as the setting is, I feel like it's also a missed opportunity. We've reached the point where open worlds should offer more than just topographic obstacles, especially when they're going to be this large. 
Yes, I know there's hostile fauna, but Bayek is too formidable a warrior to be in any real danger, even when fighting large packs of animals. Considering the threat posed by Egypt's extreme climate, it would have been great if Ubisoft incorporated survival elements into the game. Even the strongest man pales before the might of Mother Nature. Make desert exploration a challenge. Imagine a version of Origins where Bayek could get heatstroke, forcing players to seek shelter from the sun. They've already got mirages, which occur when exposed to the heat for too long. Maybe these could act as a precursor to overheating. What if to counter it, you would have to keep Bayek hydrated, which would require a supply of water? Make oases and fresh water springs points of interest on the map where players could refill their canteens, which could also be upgraded to hold larger amounts of water. Additionally, while hunting allows players to upgrade Bayek's various stats, it essentially serves no purpose once you're fully leveled. What if you had to hunt for food? It would add a new dynamic to exploration and would force players to slow down and prepare for long treks. Fast travel could require resources, and if you don't have the resources for the journey, then you would only be able to fast travel as far as you have food and water for. It's not hard to think of ways of weaponizing an open world setting. These are ideas I just made up on the spot. A survival mode would fundamentally change the way you play this game, and I think, for the better. I know it seems like I've been mainly negative on Origins, but I do genuinely like it. I'm just... disappointed by it. It's not the reinvention I was hoping for. Origins was influenced by The Witcher 3's success, but it doesn't fully comprehend what made it so special. The narrative lessons learned are surface level. Its approach to quest design is inconsistent. The combat, while on solid footing, could be better. Yet at the same time, its setting is incredibly realized, evoking the natural wonder and biodiversity of an actual countryside. Before Origins, you could track the release of AC games on your watch. Ubisoft took a year off to refine and tinker with the formula. It wasn't an unmitigated success, but if this is what they accomplished with that additional year, I hope they continue this trend. It's got a great deal of promise, and I'd hate for them to squander it falling back on old habits. The Witcher 3 is the metric by which I grade all open world games from now on. CD Projekt Red took everything that the genre aspired towards and set the bar unreasonably high. They ruined open world games for me, but they also made me hopeful for the future of the genre, and I'm eternally grateful to them for doing so. They're forcing a revolution of the genre, which prior to The Witcher 3 was in danger of becoming stagnant. But now? Publishers have to work harder if they want to hit those highs. World building, writing, mission design, combat. These are the components The Witcher 3 excels at, and what developers need to as well if they ever want to hang with the best. And thankfully, they seem to be up to the task. Over two years later, we finally have our first worthy successor. Horizon Zero Dawn is a masterpiece for many of the same reasons The Witcher 3 is, but also for reasons of its own. Much like its doe-eyed protagonist, it defied expectations at every turn. It played like butter, had a gripping narrative, and proved to the world that the blueprint which CD Projekt Red seemingly perfected actually could be improved upon. Assassin's Creed Origins, on the other hand, helps us understand why that blueprint is difficult to emulate. The Witcher 3 isn't great just because it has evolving quest lines and lots of content. It's great because quests are buoyed by clever writing and game design that's respectful of the player's time. Ubisoft missed a mark with Origins, and that's okay. The fact that they tried is something to be commended, because even though they fell short, it still resulted with the best Assassin's Creed in a long time. But publishers can't just copy and paste the formula indefinitely. If they're not going to innovate and bring something unique to the table, then they should at the very least refine what came before it. And they can never forget why we play these games in the first place. That sense of adventure, of discovery, of possibility. For the stories they tell, and the stories we make on our own. So yeah. In a post to Witcher 3 world, I want the stars. I know that's a tad unrealistic, which is why I'll settle for the moon. I think that's a more than reasonable compromise.